Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, Merry Christmas. <laughs> it's kind of weird to think that Christmas is in five days. I, uh, I'm still scratching my head about that one. Even though we've been in the middle of lockdown, time has flown by really, really quickly. And uh, just happy to report, talked with uh, Scott earlier this week, and I actually see him in the audience today. So, you know, that's an amazing answer to prayer, and I'm sure he's still on the mend. Um, but baby steps, right? That's pretty awesome. Just thinking about that right now, I mean, you know, we covet your prayers for all people everywhere who are, who are suffering from COVID or, you know, have other things going on medically, but aren't getting the same level of treatment that they would normally need because we got zero ICU beds available in Southern California right now. I mean, it is a serious thing. And uh, so I encourage you to respond to that with prayer and uh, just seek the Lord every day. Pray for people, pray for healing, pray for an end to this and pray for God to break through the hearts of people using this as an opportunity to wake people up to who he is, right? Yeah, we can clap for that. <laughs> well, since this is going to be our uh, Christmas message, we're not going to be in Matthew this morning. We're going to be in Luke. So don't turn there yet, but we'll get there in a second. First, I kind of wanted to set things up. And uh, have any of you heard of Forrest Fenn? Anybody? No? Forrest Fenn was a art collector and dealer, lived in New Mexico. And over the course of his lifetime, he accumulated quite a few valuable treasures, gems, um, maybe some ancient artifacts. And he put them all together into a box and he went into the Rocky Mountains and he hid the box. And then he wrote a book and a poem about the hiding of this treasure, which he then published. And uh, it wasn't until this past summer that the treasure was finally discovered as people tried to decipher this poem. Here's, here's his poem. I thought I'd read it to you. See if you can figure out where the treasure is based on these six verses. This is what it says. As I have gone alone in there, and with my treasures bold, I can keep my secret where, and hint of riches new and old. Begin it where warm waters halt, and take it in the canyon down, not far, but too far to walk, put in below the home of Brown. From there, it's no place for the meek. The end is ever drawing nigh. There will be no paddle up your creek, just heavy loads and water high. If you've been wise and found the blaze, look quickly down your quest to cease. But tarry scant with marvel gaze, just take the chest and go in peace. So why is it that I must go and leave my trove for all to seek? The answer I already know. I've done it tired and now I'm weak. So hear me all and listen good, your effort will be worth the cold. If you are brave and in the wood, I give you title to the gold. That's Forrest Fenn's poem. Really clear where the treasure is, right? People spent 10 years looking for the treasure. And when I read that poem and think about the treasure and the struggles that people have had finding it, sometimes I feel like that's how God talks to us. Or sometimes I feel like that's how people think God talks to us. In riddles and poems and things that make it hard to understand what he's saying to us. And so that kind of raises a question in my mind, which is how does God talk to us? How does he talk to you? Does he, how does he communicate his message? And what does it look like to hear from God? So today, I want us to see how we hear from God at Christmas. And really, it's at all times of life. Uh, what God's Christmas message is and how to respond to the Christmas message. So if you want, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. And again, just kind of to give you that, that roadmap of where we're going, how we hear from God at Christmas, what God's Christmas message is, and how to respond to the Christmas message. Like I said, this is in Luke 2. So we're taking a break from Matthew, Luke 2. And we're going to look at verses 8 through 20, which is the story of the shepherds hearing from the uh, angel and then having the whole angelic host appear before them and then them running into uh, Bethlehem to corroborate the angel's message. So this is what Luke 2 says. 
Being in verse 8. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. And lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. And they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. This is God's word. Let us pray. Lord God, we just thank you that we get a chance to gather here, either in person here right now or digitally watching this service someplace. But as believers, we are unified together in you because of Christ. And we thank you for a chance to worship you, to just praise you. It's Christmas season, Lord, and I pray that we would take the message of Christmas deep into our hearts and that it would be something that we meditate on every day. And so we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us in that. In your name we pray. Amen. So how does God talk to us? What does he do here that shows how he talks to us? And I think, first of all, we can say pretty easily, some people hear from God in spectacular ways, (laughs) right? The angel and then the angelic host appearing to the shepherds. In my book, that's a pretty spectacular way God, God talks to you. Anybody on board with that? Pretty spectacular, right? Uh, now, where are the angels in your mind's eye when you see them? Is, 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 it's probably Gabriel. It doesn't say, but is Gabriel in the air? Is he levitating when he talks to them and then the angelic host is in the air? Or is he standing on the ground, right? Every Christmas card I've ever seen, the angels are always in the air. And I went back and I read this text a whole bunch and it never once says that. It doesn't say they're in the air. So I think probably what happened is that just like other appearances of angels, they're standing on the ground, right? And they just suddenly fill this whole field where these shepherds are, and the glory of the Lord shines. I think it's really interesting here, too, that the glory of the Lord doesn't shine around the baby Jesus or the manger, right? It shines because the angels are relaying the word of God. And when God's word is deployed, his glory goes with it. Right? So he's speaking to these shepherds in this most spectacular way. Can you imagine that? You're out at night with the sheep, and it's probably, you know, a, a nice evening. They're outside, maybe a little cold, and suddenly bright, angelic visitors show up, and the glory of the Lord is shining everywhere. That is spectacular, right? That, that's like ringing the bell, okay, I'm paying attention. You have me. I, I, we're locked in. What are you saying? Sometimes God speaks to us in spectacular ways. And for some people, that might be something like a vision or a dream. Anybody ever had God speak to them in a vision or a dream? That's happened to me before. I went uh, to a a pastor conference. We were planning a church in San Diego. And there was this uh, group of um, like-minded church planters. And the key speaker was just an amazing speaker and thought he was great. And um, that night we were staying at the house of one of his co-pastors, and I had a dream that God said, you need to go tell this guy that he will lose his church in 10 years because of his pride. Now, this was in 2004. Now, there's like thousands of people at this conference. I've never met this guy before. I was like, that could have been a bad slice of pepperoni I had last night, <laughs> right? I, I don't really want to go tell this guy this. 
So I told my you know, fellow pastors that were with me, and I told his co-pastor, and they said, are you going to go tell him? And I was like, no, I'm not going to go tell him. I don't, you know, I don't know. But boy, that stuck with me, and I told them. Ten years later, in 2014, he stepped down from his church. It had all just fallen apart. And I just remembered this, and I go, wow, God was speaking to me, and I repented for not being faithful and communicating that. But sometimes God speaks to us in spectacular ways. It might be that where you hear an audible voice. I've had people before tell me, People who were not believers have, have contacted me because they said, I woke up this morning and I heard God give me a message. It was a clear, audible voice in the room. And this is what it said, blah, 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 blah. And I'm convinced now that God is real. What do I do? Okay? It's pretty spectacular. Sometimes you get God speaking to you in a spectacular way that's, that's more like a series of events where you can't but know that God has led you to a certain path. You might call it coincidence. But I would say God is arranging events in a certain way. And as I think about uh, how we found the rental that we're in right now this year, I have to conclude God was speaking to us. Because, you know, we were selling our house. We were in escrow. you got to start finding a rental. And we first went and put an application at one place, and we got approved. But the more we thought about it, we thought, we don't want to be in that house. So we said no. We put an application in another place. They were like, oh, you're just not the right fit. They turned us down. Then we put an application in another place. Best place we'd seen yet. Huge house, uh, kind of just an amazing spot. We were like, oh, this is perfect. And the property manager said, you know, you guys are, are great. I'm sure you'll get it. And then he calls us up and he says, well, turns out somebody else offered more money. So we're going to go with them. Okay, we're back looking again. Where are we going to go, God? And we were viewing another place. And we got a call or a text, I think, maybe from Daryl or Shar that said they had seen a, a house in Camarillo as they were kind of, I think Shar was doing her walk. And uh, she said, you should go check it out. So we drove over there right that afternoon, like 10 minutes later. I think we were maybe one of the first people to see it. We got approved. And the day we were moving, we got a call from the third house, the m most amazing house. It said, well, those people that offered more money, everything fell through. So do you want it? Now, I would have told you in the natural, right, I would have said, yeah, but I felt like we had been stopped by God from getting approved for that house, that we were supposed to be in the house we're in now. It turns out the neighborhood's amazing. There are tons of families. There's people that we can reach, and we really feel like God has led us there. And there's more to that story if you want to hear some more on the side, but sometimes God speaks to us in spectacular ways. And so I just want to prepare you for that. That's sometimes how he works. But for most of us, his message comes through ordinary people, right? Sometimes it's spectacular, but for most of us, God speaks to us through ordinary people. Look what happens with the shepherds. They hear the message from the angel and then the angelic host. And so what do they do? They rush off. They say uh, to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. They found Mary and Joseph and the baby. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. So what happens here is that the shepherds don't just tell Mary and Joseph, right? You don't have an angelic visitation of that magnitude and rush into the town and only tell Mary and Joseph. They're telling everybody what happened on the way to find Mary and Joseph. And they're telling everybody what happened on the way out, back to their sheep. They're telling the whole town. And this is how God's message usually gets communicated to us, through ordinary people. What does that look like? Well, we have friends who try to speak gently into our lives over our uh, cracks and failures in our character right? They, they try to be very gentle with us and let us know how we're, how we're blowing it. Our significant others are really great at this, right? They're really great at being very gentle with us. Um, and I say gentle because uh, sometimes it doesn't feel very gentle because it's personal, right? Like one of the things that, that I know that faith is always telling me about is that I am a very incredibly patient person. And sometimes my patience rubs her the wrong way because I'm willing to endure things that she's like, this is wrong. We should not be enduring this. You need to do this. Move faster, right? And so she lets me know about that. Perhaps you have things that your significant other has gently let you know. 
You know what? I really believe, though, that that's sometimes how God speaks to us about improving our character, right? You spouses, you can look at one another and see, see, it's the word of the Lord speaking to you when I tell you about that, that character flaw you've got, right? Because they see us clearly. It's so hard for us to see ourselves clearly. Another way that God speaks to us through ordinary people is through the scripture right here, right? This is passed down to us through ordinary people, through the apostles. We have the Bible passed down to us. And, and what strikes me as so unusual is that people say, oh, well, you can't trust the Bible. We don't know, you know, who wrote that. But I want to tell you right now, the Bible is the most accurate document we have in all of history. You have a confidence rate of knowing that this is what actually Jesus said or what people wrote 2,000 years ago of over 99.5%. It might be 99.7%. We have more confidence in the pages of the New Testament than we do in the works of Shakespeare. We have more confidence in the pages of the New Testament than we do in the works of Plato or Aristotle or Homer or any ancient writer. We have over 25,000 fragments from the New Testament and over 5,000 complete manuscripts. This is an incredibly accurate document and you can take it to the bank that this is what has been passed down to you. I could go on and on telling you the internal evidence that supports it. Things in the text, things that just don't make any sense. And I could share with you external evidence that we have about, you know what, John had apostles or disciples of his own. And after he wrote the books that he wrote, we have writings from his disciples that attest to what he wrote. We can do that for every single book in the, in the scripture. So how does God speak to us? Sometimes spectacularly, but usually through ordinary people. Sometimes in what they say to us day to day, and oftentimes just through the pages of Scripture. This is how God is talking to us, and that's a pretty awesome thing. So, we have here this famous Christmas passage. What is God's Christmas message to us? The message of God is that there is now peace available to those who will accept it. That, in a nutshell, is the Christmas message. It's not about presents under the tree. It's not about reindeer, right? It's not, it's not even about joy. That's a secondary message. The first message is that there's peace from God available to those who will accept it. So look at what happens here. This, this great company of heavenly hosts appear, right? And they appear uh, after the angel's first message and they confirm what he says. So he says this, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. So the reason that's not the primary message is because the joy is based on what he's about to say. And who is the joy for? It's for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That's a really unique word, Savior there. It could have been used sometimes for medical doctors who saved you from some kind of life-threatening uh, illness. It might have been used for attorneys who saved you in court. The idea was that you were in great distress, great danger, and you got saved by somebody. And so this Savior day, uh, uh, of the, the line of David comes and saves those who are in almost certain risk of perishing. That's what the idea is there of this word Savior. And he says... That you're, this is going to be the sign. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. The swaddling clothes wouldn't be unusual, but it's lying in a manger in this feed trough. That's unusual. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. This peace is really interesting. This peace here is not peace between the U.S. and China, right? It's not peace between Russia and the United States or any other nation. It's not peace between different tribes. It's not peace between the Hatfields and the McCoys or between neighbors that you've got a feud with. This peace really means peace between God and man because there has been war between God and man. You maybe don't know it. You maybe not be aware of that fact that there's been war going on. There's been disharmony. Absolute total war. Nahum 1-2 says, The Lord is avenging and wrathful and keeps wrath for his enemies. God has had great anger and wrath for people. Why? Because mankind said, I'm going to do my own thing. 
I'm going to be my own God. And the best way to, to visualize this is you've got to think about kingdoms at work here. It's not just my personal will and somebody else's will. You've got to think about kingdoms, right? And when we sin, we're saying, uh, I'm going to be in my own kingdom. I don't want to follow that other kingdom. And that is revolution. And no king can stand that. And the scripture is very clear that God has been patient for a long time. That his, his, his wrath has been delayed. But he has wrath. And the coming of Jesus foretells here, what the angels are saying, is that God is declaring peace for people. We've been trying to be our own God. And God's been really angry about it. But here he's declaring peace for those on whom his favor rests. And Francis, uh, Francois Bovon, he says the word choice here by Luke always indicates, using this word peace, the divine will to save. God has decided, I'm going to try to save these people even though I'm so, so angry because of what they've done violates who I am. So peace here has happened. It was done by God. That's what the angels say. On, on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Jesus, the Savior, comes to save the whole world. Notice that earlier. The angel said, it's joy for all the people, but this peace is only good for those of his good pleasure. You see that in the, the angelic host. So Jesus is coming. The Savior is coming. This peace will be for all people, but only good for those who actually accept it. Isn't that the way it goes with gifts? If you have a present that's given to you, and you never unwrap it, you never take it home, what good is that present to you? Maybe you need some new appliance. What's a new appliance somebody might need? A, ra a, ra a range. Perfect. Okay? <laughs> I said appliance. Banjo hardly counts as an appliance, although it is a tool, according to some people. So you need a new range, and somebody gifts you a range, and it gets delivered and put in your garage and you never unwrap it, you never install it, you never use it. It's no good to you. This is what the angels are saying about the peace of God. He's done it. It's available for everybody, but it's only effective if you actually receive his peace. The elect, those chosen who respond to the message. So what is the best way then to respond to the Christmas message? And I think we get here several different responses. Okay, so let's look at this. The people who heard this message were amazed. Uh, I'm reading the ESV here, and uh, what it says here is that all who heard it wondered. But some of your texts, that's uh, verse 18, by the way, some of your texts will say they were amazed at what the shepherds had to say. What does this word mean, this wondered or this amazed word? It's a word that indicates an emotional response. Uh, one author says that, what this uh, message does is it tickles the ears of the people in Bethlehem. It pleases them, it causes a stir, and this word reflects surprise at encountering God's revelation. But it doesn't indicate faith. They wonder at it, they're amazed at it. And I feel like that is the typical response we have at Christmas time. We are amazed by it. It's exciting to hear. We wonder at it. There's emotional response. But that doesn't indicate faith. And when I look at our culture by and large, that's how people want to respond to Christmas. You got a million Christmas commercials out right now. All these car commercials where, you know, there's reindeer and Mercedes Benz or whatever it is. You know, somebody's gifting somebody a new car, come outside, surprise. Uh, or you get like the surprise reveal of dad, you know, who shows up from the, the military and he's surprise kids, I'm home for Christmas. There's this emotional response, wonder, amazement, you know, kind of good feelings. That is totally okay to respond that way at Christmas. We should have wonder and amazement. But it's wrong if we only have that, if we just stop there with only the emotional response. Look at what happens with Mary. This is going to be verse 19. Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned. So Mary does two things here. She treasures and then she ponders. And the treasure word is a really cool word. It's a word that signifies a mental collection of events. 
she's going through in her mind's eye and thinking about when Gabriel first talked to her and what he said to her. And she's thinking about what happened when she went and saw Elizabeth and the baby leapt in the womb. And now she's thinking about the angel's message and what they've just said. And she's mentally collecting these memories. It's a conscious act of storing memories, of gathering remembrances. She's assembling various reports and events and building a picture in her mind of what happened. So first thing she does is she treasures. She gathers. She collects what God has been saying to her. And then she ponders. This is a great word. Here, what this word means is that Mary is taking her assembled memories and she begins to actively meditate on them, to actively mull them over, to mash them up in her mind and say, what is God doing? Meditating, thinking, trying to see the pattern and to discover what God is saying. If you want to hear God, you must ponder God's message. You must ponder what he's saying to you. If he speaks to you spectacularly, great. Take that in, treasure it, and then begin to ponder it. Mull it over. Okay, God, what are you saying? If he's speaking to you just typically through people or through his scripture, say, okay, God, I'm opening myself up to you. What are you saying to me? Work it into your life. Ponder it. Meditate it. Don't let it go. Just really kind of get in there mentally, psychologically. Try to see the pattern and see what is God saying to you. See, most of us, I think, are amazed at Christmas and we have this emotional experience. But when Christmas is over, we're ready for New Year's. And when New Year's is over, what comes next? I think it's Valentine's Day, right? (laughs) Rose Parade, yeah. You know, and then, and then after Valentine's Day, we move on to the next thing. Emotionally, we gear up for that, whatever it is. When really a better way to respond is to be amazed, to be moved, to be emotional about the message of Christmas, that there's peace for people, peace for me, who's an enemy of God without Jesus, and then to ponder that and say, okay, what does that mean? How will that change me today? What will I do tomorrow as a result of this message? We have to plunge the story of Christmas down deep into ourselves and we have to wrestle with it and we have to ask questions of it. And we have to be willing to let God's story ask questions of us, to let his message speak to us. God, what are you saying to me? God, (laughs) I hear you, God, and I'm so uncomfortable with what you're saying. I don't like that. I want to keep doing things the way I've been doing them, Lord. But if I really ponder, it changes me and transforms me. So how can you then ponder this? Well, like I started off talking about, Forrest Fenn's treasure, which he buried 10 years ago, was found this past summer. And I think the way it was found really has something to speak to us today. It was found by a man named Jack Stoof. And he found it, first of all, by avoiding all of the other theories that are out there on the internet about where the treasure was, which I find pretty interesting. He avoided the, 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 the rabble of the crowds, and he said, you know what, I'm going to go right to the source, and he tried to view as many video interviews of Forrest as he could. He read as much of Forrest's writing as he could. He listened to audio interviews, and he began to build a picture of who Forrest is. Really fascinating. You can go and read this account. I think it's in Outside uh, Magazine. You can find that online. He talks about how he tried to figure out who Forrest is as a person. And then, then, once he had a picture of who he is, used the poem and clues to find the treasure. And he found it. He found a box that think, they think is valued over a million dollars with jewels and treasure and something like that. And he found it because he tried to understand who Forrest is. And if you're trying to hear God's message to you, it may seem like he talks in poems and riddles, right? But if you ponder who he is, you meditate on who he is, you seek to get to know who God is, then his message becomes very easy and clear to understand. You can't just read your Bible once a month and think, I'm going to be able to understand what God's saying to me. It takes that daily kind of pondering, putting it into my life, asking God every day. And it doesn't have to be hours. 
could just be a few minutes a day. Just, God, what are you saying to me? God, what's going on? God, what are you doing? When you do that, then you are truly pondering the Prince of Peace. And you know what I really love uh, here about this is that the, one of the big themes in Luke is peace. And so here at the beginning of Jesus' life, we have the angels saying, this is the Savior, and he's going to save you because you've been at war with God, and now there is peace he is the Prince of Peace. And do you know in Luke, the first words of Jesus to his gathered disciples, there were some incidents where he met them on the Emmaus Road, but his first words to his gathered disciples was peace to you. He brings peace because he took the wrath of God on himself. We see that in Romans. Uh, Romans 5, 1 and 5, 9 talk about how the wrath of God was poured out on Christ, Right? So that we can have peace with God. If you want to know what God is saying to you, what he's saying to you is there is peace with him if you will be willing to receive it. That is the true message of Christmas. And that's an amazing message. And I think that we forget that. Because it's been 2,000 years and you've heard Christmas messages your whole entire life. Right? We just forget it. But the true message of Christmas is there is peace between you and God. And he wants you to ponder him. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you that you are God that wants us to experience peace with you. Thank you for coming to this earth. You shed all your glory. and You shed everything uh, that was of any worth and came as a poor baby in the middle of nowhere and began a life uh, that you lived to save us from our lives that we've lived. And so we thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen. So we've got some 